Welcome everybody to this interview on the occasion of the Ladijenskaya lecture. Let me quickly introduce our speaker, Svetlana Mayboroda. Um, she's a Ukrainian mathematician and grew up and studied in Kharkiv. Um, she did her PhD at the University of Missouri at Columbia in the United States and just recently moved from her position as presidential McKnight professor at the University of Minnesota to the DETH Zurich. And she's also um, president of the Simons Collaboration on Localization of Waves, which is a huge international and interdisciplinary project. Welcome, Svetlana. Thank you. Um, so for those who are not familiar with your research, can you tell us about your research areas and most prominent results in simple terms? That's not easy, right? <laughs> Um, so I work at the intersection of harmonic analysis, geometric measure theory, and PDEs. Um, I do also direct this huge collaboration. So I work with physicists and engineers, both experimental and pure. Um, the, this project in particular is devoted to um, the behavior of waves and disordered media. And the um, uh, phenomenon that we call localization, uh, which is basically the fact that the propagation could come to a complete halt without anything visibly preventing it from happening mm -hmm. other than disorder in the system. And this is a transition from um, conductor to an insulator, transition from sine cosine waves to exponentially decay and eigenfunctions mathematically. And um, the point is sort of um, one can try to understand when the localization is happening, how, and so on. And um, most of results before us, I mean, the phenomenon is something like 50 years old. And most of the results before us were statistical, mm -hmm. uh, which unfortunately fall short of needs of physicists and engineers, just because it's not the information which is detailed enough. Um, our theorems and the subject, our methods are deterministic and for the first time they allow actually to harness the power of localization to use localization instead of fighting it to create new materials, ultimately new devices. So this is an easy corner of explanation because it's sort of applied work with um, applications in particular. What I actually do in life other than talking to physicists and engineers is more in the corner of classical geometric measure theory and harmonic analysis. So mm -hmm. I prove theorems which stand behind it and not only behind it, um, analyze the structure of uh, free boundaries of the boundaries forming under sort of natural phenomena such that minimization of energy in various contexts and things like this. Um, prove relationships between regularity of PDs and geometric properties of the of sets or of coefficients, all of that. Mm -hmm. So I prove theorems. I'm lucky enough that occasionally they get applied, but mm -hmm. really my uh, my main job is sort of in the corner of harmonic analysis and GMT. Mm -hmm. Okay, one can tell that there are many interesting questions. So uh, what excites you most about the current state of low wave localization research and where do you see the field headed for the next five to ten years? Well, so again, I mean, sort of my work is um, in different projects and slightly different fields. Um, in the particular context of localization, the biggest open problem is to be able to prove delocalization. No mm -hmm. one actually manages to prove that something is not localized so far. Mm -hmm. um, not that localization is completely understood, but at least there are regimes in which it is, and no one can prove delocalization. So that's sort of the big obvious problem. Uh, the location of the mobility age, which is transition between localized and delocalized states, both from mathematical and from the physical point of view, is widely open. That's as far as the wave localization corner goes. Mm -hmm. Now, if one goes into free boundary problems and geometric measure theory and things like this, I mean, of course, there is a number of open problems about the structure of free boundaries. We barely understand the structure of level sets for 
harmonic functions on manifolds. So there are many open problems in that corner and um, you know, more generally the, the rate of growth of solutions, the rate of decay of solutions, all of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, your personal path to, to mathematics. You studied as well finance, finance and uh, applied mathematics. So was there any particular moment when you knew that you were to become a mathematician or any particular aspect that was fascinating you to decide for mathematics? Um, honestly, no, nothing <laughs> particular. So uh, first of all, applied mathematics where I come from is partial differential equations. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with applied or, you know, <laughs> It's, uh, it's not in the Western, you know, European or American sense of the word. It just means, you know, basically a study of partial differential equations. So it wasn't that applied to start with. Mm -hmm. I also, yes, I do have a degree in finance, but it was a bit of a, um, a random chance in the sense that um, I uh, got invited to a graduate school in the United States and decided to try it out because it seemed like an interesting opportunity. It so happened that it was in mathematics and you know, then it went well and the rest is mm -hmm. history. But it's not, a, you know, it, it wasn't a big decision. It was more okay. like a sequence of fun opportunities. Yeah, and some, some lucky circumstances. And some lucky circumstances. Okay, yeah. so you already mentioned that you've been to quite diverse mathematical communities, like uh, the Ukraine, the US, also Australia for a short time, mm -hmm. and now Switzerland. Are there any key challenges you faced while adapting to these environments or um, any rewarding experiences that maybe shaped your, uh, your personality or your research? Quite frankly, it's really hard for me to say. So I just moved to Switzerland a month ago, so I don't mm -hmm. know yet. Ask me a little later. Um, between the US and Ukraine, I mean, it was such a difference in any other sense that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I didn't really perceive it as a change of academic community in the sense that I was an undergraduate in Ukraine. I, did research, but really tiny little bit as a sort of undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, so it was more of a change to a completely different mathematical environment. It's not like I really knew mathematical environment in Ukraine, again, being mm -hmm. a student. Mm -hmm. And with Switzerland, we will see. Okay. Yes. okay. So it's a bit of, yeah, I, I can't really say yet. Okay, thanks for, for the insights. Um, so uh, the lecture today was uh, um, to Ladijenskaya, and uh, she also faced many challenges in her career, also um, uh, as part of the political climate. So um, given your Ukrainian heritage, you must have a very unique view on like the ongoing situation. If you feel comfortable, um, is there any influence on your like personal life or your per perspective as a mathematician that you would like to share? I mean, of course, it's a tragedy what's going on in Ukraine right now. It influences us all deeply. My generation is facing it very acutely because our boys die and, you know, by boys, I mean also um, men of my generation. So everything is very, uh, um, very inflamed, very painful. I mean, I know many people who have not come back from this war and um, this is a really vivid challenge and um, will definitely, in mathematics and outside of mathematics, um, affect relationship between um, mm -hmm. mathematicians coming from different backgrounds, I mean, coming now. I mean, of course, those of us who immigrated 20 years ago are somewhat in a different situation, but nonetheless, you know, we all feel it and we are all um, hit by it. My father is in Ukraine, mm -hmm. so for me, it's a very um, first-hand situation. Um, it's, 
b before, you know, well, before, 20 years before, it, it just was a different experience, I would say. Yeah. But right now, for the past 10 years, not only with the war, but from um, um, from previous attempts at invasion and everything, um, it, it's difficult to deal with it mm -hmm. for all of us. Thank you so much for, for sharing. It's very valuable insight. Um, apart from the political climate, um, there are also challenges that you face as a woman in, in mathematical research, which is still under, like women are still underrepresented. Um, are there any like specific um, obstacles you, you faced and do you have any specific advice, uh, especially for women in academics or in mathematical research to, to succeed in this environment? I'm not sure I have anything you know, new to say in some sense. I mean, the problem is real, the problem exists. Uh, women are heavily underrepresented, particularly at very high levels. Mm -hmm. Somehow, the total numbers across all universities are maybe uh, not that horrible, but the higher you go, the, the fewer there are. Yeah. And um, there is a very real problem. How, how to solve it, I mean, I, can repeat, you know, the standard recommendations, but um, the bias is real, the, the problem is real, and well, let's just hope that the next generation does better, because at the very least among students there are more women yeah. now. So yeah. I hope that all the measures which are taken towards the support are actually going to mm -hmm. help the problem. Yeah, I can only agree with that. Um, so, uh, Speaking of the environment, um, there is also a trend that mathematics is more and more collaborative. There are more and more papers being published uh, uh, as a collaboration of many researchers or a few mm -hmm. researchers, as opposed to uh, auth uh, papers written by single authors. Um, how do you experience the mathematical research? Is it more a solitary experience or a social experience? And do you see any, any trends for the future? I, I work a lot in collaboration, um, more because it's fun than anything else. Mm -hmm. I, um, I'm lucky to have really um, good collaborators who are also good friends and, uh, you know, great people to work with. Um, we really enjoy doing math together. I say there is always a moment of solitude in the sense that, you know, at the end of the day, you close the door and try to prove the theorem. Mm -hmm. Um, but nonetheless, sort of the, um, there is a, a lot of it done in collaboration for me, and it's a source of both inspiration and fun. I mean, I, um, I'm very grateful to all my collaborators for the um, great moments yeah. shared in this research. I like that you mentioned the fun, which is, can also be a very important part of research. Um, and uh, also the honesty that at the end of the day you have to understand like your, your topics and your proofs, even if you're collaborating with other people. Um, so speaking, speaking of fun, there is like more to, to mathematical research than just the math itself. So it needs collaboration, it needs soft skills on a personal level, uh, it needs networking. Um, is there any, any aspect or anything that you consider as very important to be successful in mathematics or something that is maybe um, neglected or underrated, but important in your opinion for, for math research? I don't know, sort of, you know, the way you mentioned, I mean, for, for me, mathematics is very collaborative and so it's important mm -hmm. to be able to talk to people and understand other people and, um, um, again, have an experience leading the interdisciplinary collaboration for me, it's quite often understanding people from very different areas. Mm -hmm. I cannot really say it's a necessity. You can also do mathematics sitting in your corner with your pencil on your own or with your favorite person which is closest to you in the mm -hmm. entire world in terms of science. I mean, both are possibilities, but it's going to affect the 
the results. I would say, you know, the beauty of mathematics is that you really can come from anywhere in terms of um, backgrounded personality in some sense and do mathematics successfully. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a different way of doing research, but all of these ways could be mm -hmm. equally successful. It does help if you have social skills. Yeah. Just, yeah. you know, it helps, to, it helps to connect to people. It helps to explain why your results are good. It helps to sort of, because, you know, part of it is actually being able to interest others in your results. Mm -hmm. And that's helpful. But in principle, you know, <laughs> anything works as long as you can prove theorems. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it might also be uh, individual to every person. So it's, it's, it's great that there is this diversity in math and that research can find their own way of, of conducting the research. Um, in one of your uh, uh, previous interviews, you, you said, uh, you gave some advice which I found quite inspiring, which I want to quote. Uh, you have to love learning what you are learning as much as actually being able to find something, which also illustrates that in math it takes a long way until you reach a result and then it might only take a short time to actually pin it down and uh, publish it. Um, so uh, concerning advice for, for young researchers, um, is there anything you would recommend or something that helped you in your early stages of career to uh, maybe overcome the periods until you actually uh, find a result or uh, in any other stage of the research? At the early stages, it really helps to have good mentors and good collaborators, at the very least to keep you afloat when things are hard, mm -hmm. you know, and just not... Um, um, then you are together in your desperation, which is <laughs> at least somewhat more <laughs> exciting than being alone in your desperation. Um, but honestly, I mean, I find that, you know, good researchers in mass are not, are mostly driven by curiosity. You know, you, you sort of, I mean, you, you end up solving problems that you can't breathe without <laughs> solving, you know, like you are just, I mean, it's, it's part of you, it's, uh, it's part of your day and night and sleep and waking up and drinking coffee and everything else. So in the end of the day, you really have to love the mess that you are doing. You have to love the problem that you are trying to solve. And again, same in, in any other field. I mean, it's, I feel it's health has to be driven by curiosity because then you will actually put the time needed naturally into trying to crack it. Yeah. And otherwise, you know, sort of any, any other incentive I find will wear itself out very fast, you know, in, in this strange yeah. world of mathematics where you spend, you know, months, occasionally years yeah. trying to actually. Yeah, I advance. feel what you're saying. The intrinsic motivation helps a lot to, to overcome many obstacles like the frustration yeah, tolerance. Yeah, it just has to be, you know, you have to love it. And if yeah. you don't, honestly, there are other things to do in life, so. Okay, okay, that's great. Um, so maybe as a final question, um, if you would be able to solve one major unsolved problem tomorrow, what problem would you, would you pick and why? Aye, <laughs> that's a tough <laughs> one. <laughs> um, they change. <laughs> Meaning that, you know, it's... Uh, um, I don't know. Among those that we have discussed today, I mean, obviously, you know, delocalization is, a, is, is quite hard. But I, I would say that, you know, it's not really for me about the um, being able to solve a given famous problem. It's more being able to understand some sense. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if the solution somehow magically comes without you know, real progress and understanding, which occasionally happens, it sort of closes the door rather than opens the door, then it's not as much fun. <laughs> so, 
I, I can't really say. I mean, in the sense that you know, I'm trying to understand several things, and um, I I hope it I hope it comes. I, I love how that also refers to to the advice I quoted before. You have you have to love learning what you are learning, and yeah, so, uh, so for you the the most important thing is to gain the understanding and not so much to to actually only solve the problem, but more to focus on the under, on the understanding you gain along the way of solving yeah. solving the I problem. I mean, don't get me wrong, the ambition is there, <laughs> but um, it's it's not the only point. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much for those insights for this interview. Um, and I think we can close with this. Thank you.